Well, you've talked a bit about how the connection between alcohol and intuition, and mm. I was intrigued by that. Like, what, what have you seen as the connection there that you've well, made? Well, I think, again, as I mentioned earlier, I think alcohol, people don't want to go there, right? That's how they socialize. That's how they hang out with their friends. That's how they wind down. That's how they deal with the background anxiousness. Uh, and they don't really want to see how this drink can impact how they feel and how they truly can know what their body loves and what their body doesn't love. So alcohol can impact both you, your body on both a physiological and a psychological level. It's going to impact your gut microbiome, certainly. It's What's gonna, it doing? What's happening? It can do a few things. It's going to disrupt the microbiome. So the microbiome is, depending on the study that you look at, it's upwards of 100 trillion bacteria. And we have about 10 trillion human cells. So we are all about 10 times more bacteria than human. And when we drink alcohol, it is really, uh, especially people that are consistently drinking, it is quite disruptive to this microbiome balance. And it can breed things like bacterial overgrowth. People, a lot of the times people that I, that I talk to, they have something called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And alcohol is a component, it's certainly not the only driver of that, but it is a disruptor and breeder of bacterial overgrowth by messing up the balance the, of this microbiome uh, component. And it also can increase intestinal permeability or uh, increase what they call leaky gut syndrome. It's uh, when the things are passing through the gut that shouldn't be able to pass through the gut like undigested food proteins, bacterial toxins called lipopolysaccharides. And then that's the seminal event that a lot of things, when the immune system sees undigested food and bacterial toxins in the bloodstream, then there's something called molecular mimicry. It's sort of the, the case of mistaken identity when the immune system starts this cascade of inflammation. And that's what can trigger autoimmunity. When the immune system loses recognition of self, which I think that's happening on a physical level, but then you think about what's happening on a mental, emotional, spiritual level with so many people losing recognition of self. And we have this epidemic rise of autoimmune conditions. 50 million Americans, at the very least, have an autoimmune disease. Millions more are somewhere on that autoimmune inflammation spectrum. So alcohol's implication in that is it really is something that allows, it can tri be a trigger for a lot of people, not only on a mental, emotional level we know, but I think people's relationship with alcohol exists on a spectrum. Um, and you may not be a full-blown alcoholic. People need to look at themselves and say, how am I using this tool in my life? And is it in alignment with how I want to live my life? Is it in alignment with how I want to feel? Yeah, that's, that's a great message to, to get people to reflect on. Yeah. Uh, what, that was the physiological. What are some of the psychological things to be aware of? Yeah, well, I think the research around stress is very fascinating. I mean, we know when your body is in a state of stress, and look, st the stress is normal. It is good in measured amounts. What I'm talking about here is chronic stress. It's that I'm being chased by this tiger, but there's no tiger. Many people are stuck in various degrees of sympathetic, fight or flight, stressed state, and their body's in overdrive all the time. And we need a balance. We need the sympathetic nervous system just as much as we need the parasympathetic, the resting, the digesting mechanism. But many people are just an, an over accentuation of a sympathetic nervous system response. And cortisol levels coming up because their body is in that fight or flight mode. Cortisol is not inherently bad, just like inflammation is not inherently bad. We need inflammation to fight off viruses and bacteria and heal wounds. But it's the chronic inflammation that's a problem. Same with chronic stress. Cortisol being high for too long is not good. That is cortisol by itself is an endogenous immunosuppressant, which means it's a natural anti-inflammatory. So inflammation comes up, cortisol comes up to try to abate and attenuate the higher inflammation levels and to help you, to actually get you out of that stressed state. But it's just unsustainable because there's no real threat for many people, but they're not sleeping well. They are eating out of alignment with what's working for their body. And they are, I would say unhealthy relationships with technology and all of this will be what researchers call an, an evolutionary mismatch. There's a genetic epigenetic mismatch. Our genetics haven't changed in 10,000 years, but yet our world has changed very dramatically in a very finite period of time when you're putting that into context with the totality of human history. So if our genetics haven't changed in 10,000 years, just think of how 
much how world has changed in a few generations, mm. whether it's the foods we eat or the foods we're not eating, our stress levels, our exposure to toxins, collective and individual trauma, all of these things are the confluence of factors, the perfect storm of variables that are giving rise to these inflammatory autoimmune brain health, mental health problems. So the psychological side of how I see these stressors play out in people's lives is chronic stress, but it's a lot more nebulous, right? It's a lot more insidious because it's easy to say, don't eat those four foods because yeah. they're going to spike inflammation. It's another thing to say, well, don't stress. And then you, they're stressing about not stressing. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to really like bring context and practical tools. And what I call them in the book is metaphysical meals because you need to treat these acts of stillness just like you would mealtime, yes. which I know we're on the same page here. Like you have to, just like you show up for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you, or you show up to the gym, you need to start feeding your head and your heart just as much as you feed your body. Mm. And it's very much a part of healing. And you have to deal with both sides of the coin, both the physiological and the psychological. So stress and whether that be bringing healthy boundaries in or having a better relationship with technology or prioritizing your sleep or bringing in self-care practices in your life that are nourishing to you, that are feeding you on a mental, emotional level. Yeah. That's just one, but there are you know many levels to that, but uh, we have to look at both sides. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you so much for walking us through those. Yeah. And when, if anyone's like me, while I'm listening to that, whenever I sit down with someone who's an expert in this space, I'm like, there's a part of you that just gets more stressed because you go, oh God, I'm doing all the wrong things, right? Like, and I'm, I'm sure people are listening or watching right. at home or at work, or if you're traveling and you're going, gosh, I need to change so much. And I think that's kind of where our problems perpetuate because we go, okay, I need to change everything. Mm -hmm. And then we end up changing nothing. And I think that's always the issue, right? When you feel you want to change everything, you end up changing nothing. 